Hi, and welcome to the Church of the Holy Comforter, uh, wherever and whenever you are. It is a delight to be worshiping with you on this eighth Sunday following the Feast of Pentecost. May the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanities of vanities, all is vanity. I, the teacher, when king over Israel and Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun, and see, all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me, and who knows whether they will be wise or foolish. Yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is a vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. of sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come kneel earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal
there's joy for the morning, O sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, I'll do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Hello, I'm the Reverend Joanne Tatro, and I offer these words to you today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, once upon a time, there was a city that was an important part of a thriving industrial area. This city was situated on a vibrant and accessible waterway. It enjoyed healthy commerce and other civic relationships with neighboring cities. This city also had a lively cultural scene and many of its citizens were active, well-educated people. But over time, a series of disasters struck. And as the pendulum of time swung, the city found itself in decline, losing ground that it never seemed to gain again. There were also people of God in the city who were feeling kind of uncertain about the future of their faith community. With a lack of clarity about their future, people began to lose focus on God and the teachings of Jesus. The thing that they began to see with great clarity though was the differences between them. And although this melting pot quality of this city was one of its many positive attributes, people began to gravitate toward those who were like them, rather than looking deeper to seek and see their shared humanness and the spiritual connection between them all. The city I'm describing is Colossae, which was largely destroyed in an earthquake in the year 61. 
but it would be located in modern day Turkey if it still existed today. And the faith community I'm describing is the emerging church, which was not yet called church in those days, but it was known as the people of the way. These were the people who desired and intended to follow the teachings of Jesus. Some of the people of the way were citizens of Colossae, to whom the Apostle Paul wrote his letter. Now, the letter to the Colossians was written to keep these fledgling Christ followers focused on the gospel of Jesus that he had proclaimed during his lifetime some 40 years before Paul wrote his letter. And see, that was part of the problem. 40 years had passed. And as the time ticked away following Jesus's resurrection and ascension, Jesus hadn't returned as anticipated, at least as far as anyone could see. The people had now been waiting a long time for Jesus to return. And as we know, waiting can bring out the worst in people. What Paul referred to as earthly things like anger, greed, wrath, and evil desire. The people of the way were succumbing to those. They were being drawn away from the teachings of Jesus that the first disciples had left with them with, and they began turning to other sources, sometimes that were referred to as the principalities, the rulers, and the authorities, sources that the people began to believe would sustain them in a period of uncertainty. The signs of the times for the Colossians are not unlike the signs of our time. Our city of Baltimore has suffered a litany of setbacks in recent months and years, and truly over the course of many generations. It's not hard to notice the effects when we read the headlines, so many of which point to poverty, alienation, distrust, and inequities that have built up over the years. Perhaps all of it sadly encapsulated in one headline from earlier this month, City's slow burning anger ends in death. This headline was accompanied by a photo of the visiting Episcopal bishops as part of our general convention, marching downtown protesting yet another murder by a handgun. As a country and as a society, it seems we've turned to all manner of earthly things that we believe will sustain us. The pursuit of more and more material goods and power and yes, weapons. The reliance on substances and behaviors that numb and addict us. Prioritizing individualism and with it a false sense of connectedness. And more than enough anger, greed and abusive language all the earthly things that Paul warned against, more than enough to go around. And so we may sense, as the people of Colossae did, that there is an unraveling occurring, events and forces that are pulling people away from each other and pulling them away from what Paul calls the things from above. The author and anthropologist Margaret Wheatley has studied organizational and cultural systems, particularly in times of distress. In her 2017 book entitled, Who Do We Choose to Be? She starkly outlines the ebb and flow of 10 civilizations over the course of about 2000 years. At a certain point, as the pendulum swings in a certain direction, she writes this, 
Wealth begins to dazzle people. Defensiveness spreads. Walls are built. Political factions increase dissension. It is widely believed that human intellect can solve all the problems. The objects of worship become athletes, singers, and actors. Sound familiar? Eventually, eventually, after a long while, Wheatley writes, when money no longer rules everything, religion regains its sway and a new era begins. But just exactly how does this happen? How is it that society after society follows a pattern like this? Wheatley recalled a gathering of leadership professionals who were taking wisdom from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. He asked them, what is the cause of suffering and decay in this world? And people gave answers such as poverty, injustice, greed, and war. No, said His Holiness, it is when good people begin their work together and then fail to notice what is arising among them and between them over time. Like the idolatries that Paul mentions in his letter, like the connectedness that we believe we have achieved through human intellect, our gadgets, for instance, that instead tend to create alienation, isolation, disconnectedness, a failure to notice each other. When what God desires for us is nothing less than interconnectedness, a deeply relational life. Indeed, some contemporary studies of Paul's letters talk about a kind of second person understanding of the self. From this perspective, people are relational beings from the very beginning, and we are never free agents. We are ourselves in relation to another, and even more, we are ourselves in relation to each other and to God. This is quite counter to the individualism of most modern Western societies. Likewise, counter to our current way of navigating the world, scripture tells us that the truth of things is not always easily seen. Setting our minds on things above means seeing past deceptive appearances, past the false pretenses of those powers and principalities and authorities that claim our allegiance and our attention and dwelling instead in the promise of new life in the world that is to come and is already here in so many ways, which we may not see. It is deep within us, beneath all of the defensive mechanisms that we set up ostensibly to protect ourselves, but these instead end up alienating each other ourselves from each other. The world that God envisions for us is both to come and is also just beneath that surface, ready to be revealed by God in us, by how we act, what we do, the ways that we connect with our fellow beings. I know that some of you have profound experiences of finding God in the unexpected and sometimes hidden places of our life. Like when you quietly journey with friends who are ill or in trouble. Like when you feed people. Like when you offer your hand and your heart in some way to another being. There are many ways and I encourage you to ponder and share those ways. And I have one to share with you. Back in my former career 
in medical education, the company I worked for had a project to increase breast cancer awareness and screening access for African-Americans. African-American women, especially those living in poverty, are substantially less likely to receive preventive screenings and more likely to die from breast cancer than their white counterparts. We went door to door in the Pimlico neighborhood of Baltimore to give people screening and transportation information to increase their ability and likelihood to go and get a mammogram. We came to a street where there were only about three houses that were standing in between and around them were abandoned lots filled with trash, dead cars and car parts, lots of trash and dangerous things everywhere. The houses were just about falling down, but there were people living there. This is the kind of place that sadly does exist too much in Baltimore and other struggling cities where real human beings living in a place through no choice of their own. My project partner and I went to the door of one of these homes and knocked. The woman who came to the door appeared far older than her years of 50 something that she stated to us. She was emaciated. She told us that she was recovering from uterine cancer and caring for and raising four grandchildren on her own. Her life circumstance and where she lived seemed just about impossible to us. It could easily be held up as an example of everything that is wrong with a city in decline. And yet I was awestruck by her grace and gentle kindness. She was simply so glad that anyone had bothered to knock on her door. She said, nobody ever comes down here. She smiled. She was grateful. She thanked us. There were no complaints, no hostility, just love and happiness for this brief connection with other human beings that cared for her. This experience struck me to the core. I was in tears after we left. Something had been stirred deep within me. I'm not sure that my company or anyone involved in this project thought about it as a spiritual exercise. But for me, it has never left me and has shaped my life in so many ways in the last 10 years since that happened. I had come upon a part of God's kingdom that was hidden right here in the midst of a crumbling city block. God is so often vividly present in the neglected and those who are absent from our sight. God dwells among them. In many cases, they are hidden from our view until we stumble upon them and find that through them, God is revealed to us. And that is God moving in our hearts when we feel a stirring of compassion, of suffering, even for a moment, along with another person. That is God, the part that is deeply planted within us and hidden until it is revealed. In times of uncertainty, it's too easy for people to begin to focus on their differences and gravitate toward earthly things, things that give us a surface sense of comfort, rather than looking deeper to find the sometimes hidden, always shared humanness and spiritual connection between all of us. Christ in God, hidden in us, all in all. My friends, God is very near to us in those sitting in the pews next to us, in those we encounter in the outside world, in my cat, who I am trying mightily 
to keep off camera. God is in those whose home is in places we would not choose to enter, whose circumstances we can barely fathom. So let us be aware and set our hearts and minds on those things that reveal that heavenly city that God beckons us to create with him. Not in a faraway future, but right here and now. So that as far as anyone can see, Jesus is here among us, right here and now. Amen. High and holy God, robed in majesty, Lord of heaven and earth, we ask that you bring justice, faith, and salvation to all peoples. Let us pray as one body by responding together. Together we pray with Lord, hear us. You choose, choose us in Christ to be your people and to be the temple of your Holy Spirit. Fill your church with vision and hope. Together we pray. Your spirit enables us to cry, Abba, Father, affirms that we are fellow heirs with Christ and pleads for us in our weakness. We pray for all who are in need of di need or distress. Together we pray, Lord, hear us. In the baptism and birth of Jesus, you have opened heaven to us and enabled us to share in your glory the joy of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from before the world was made. May your whole church, living and departed, come to a joyful resurrection in your city of light. 
Together we pray. Lord, hear us. Let us commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. And now we pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and burn in your heart forevermore. Amen.